Hi, I'm Dustin Abbott, and I'm here to give you another one of my long-term reviews of some of my favorite lenses. Up until they released the new RF 50mm and 85mm lenses, I think that outside of those, this has been the best non-telephoto prime lens that they have ever produced, and that is the Canon EF 35mm f1.4 L Mark II. So I've owned this lens for about five years. After I reviewed a copy of it, um, when it when it was released, within a few months, I decided that I would bite the bullet. And even though it was expensive, I would buy one for myself because it is an exceptional lens. And it was one of the first Canon lenses of this kind. And I think I can say the same of the new 50 and 85 millimeter lenses that behave very much like an autofocusing Zeiss Otis lens. And I think that there is a certain truth about that that remains a true uh, when it comes to this particular lens. Now, since the time that this lens came out, there have been a few 35 millimeter lenses that I think are exceptional. On the you know, Canon platform, um, Zeiss came out with a 35 millimeter f1.4 uh, Milvis lens that I think is, is pretty special. It's actually not quite as sharp as this lens, but has even nicer uh, bokeh rendering, kind of overall rendering. It's manual focus, of course, and it is also very, very expensive. Now, a little bit more competitive and certainly a lens worth considering as an alternative to this is that Tamron last year released their SP 35 millimeter f1.4 lens. That lens is a really, really special lens and I think it is the closest competitor to this lens that I have seen on the Canon platform. And so it is worth consideration. But today we're here to look at the long term. How is this lens held up? And also to look at more photos than what I can typically show you in a, you know, kind of a standard review because I've been able to shoot with this lens for years in a number of situations. So we're going to start today by taking a look hands-on and seeing how this lens is held up and also what we have got here in terms of the build, the features, and the handling of the lens. Let's take a look. So like my review of the Canon 100mm f2.8 L macro lens, uh, this lens has held up beautifully well over the now four or five years that I have owned it. There is no external uh, marks on the lens, and so this kind of flocked finish has held up very well. Um, you know, the basic functionality still works just fine here as far as the front coating, it's done its job. The front element still looks pristine and there is no obvious dust inside. And so the weather resistance has also done its job. So what you have here is a lens that when lens rentals uh, broke it down, which is something that they kind of uniquely do and looked at the internals because they're in the business of having to often repair lenses that have been rented out and come back damaged. They found that this was the most heavily engineered lens internally that they had, uh, they had broken down until that point. That wasn't one of the very expensive super telephoto lenses. And so this had a very, very high level of internal um, build and uh, in terms of its just modular uh, design inside, it was at a very high level. Now, when you hold this lens in hand, it does have a fairly unique heft to it in that it's a little bit heavier than what you would anticipate looking at the size. And of course, it does have a lot of glass inside of it, but also it has, although this external, you know, kind of outer covering is this, you know, engineered plastics, um, but the inside, there is a lot of metal in there. And so it actually weighs in at 1.67 pounds or 760 grams. And so it is a very substantial lens. And so for those that are looking for a lightweight lens, this is definitely not really, I mean, it's, it's not incredibly heavy, but it's definitely on the heavier side of medium. Now, in terms of the overall dimensions, it is 3.17 inches or 80.4 millimeters in diameter. That gives it a 72 millimeter front filter thread, which is a filter thread that was fairly common in some of Canon's older uh, L series lenses. It's not as common now. We, we tend to go more often between 67 millimeters and then right up to 77 millimeters. That being said, this one is at 72 millimeters. The length is 4.15 inches or 105.5 millimeters. It was one of the early prime lenses to receive the flooring coating on the front as a, you know, a nice gasket here at the lens mount. It has internal seals inside and so it has a thoroughly kind of pro-grade build to it. 
It was uh, actually, I believe, one of the first lenses of uh, Canons to receive the center pinch cap, which is a vast improvement over their older, just side pinch caps. It's a little thicker, but it does the job a little bit better as well. It was also one of the early lenses to get a locking um, lens hood. So there's a little mock locking mechanism here that you do have to hit to release it. But, um, you know, bayonet tulip style here with a, uh, it's got kind of a, a matte felt type interior that will keep things uh, light from bouncing around there. Now the lens can focus down to 11.02 inches or 28 centimeters where it has a, you know, a useful 0.21 times magnification. That's not at the top of the chart for the 35 millimeter lens. It is better than average, however, and so very useful at minimum focus where that, you know, lack of chromatic aberration and, uh, you know, sharpness allows it to produce some really nice um, bokeh at that kind of focus distance. Of course, the standout is the blue spectrum refractive optics element that makes a huge difference. It's exotic, it's expensive, but it does a huge job of uh, helping with chromatic aberrations. It also has a pair of a spherical elements and one UD element to uh, help to set it apart optically. So overall, very clearly after years of use, this is a lens that is holding up very well, showing its own durability. It gets the job done. So obviously a lot of good there. And I think it really is a credit to Canon when it comes to these L-series lenses, how well that they do hold up. This is a lens that has seen thousands and thousands of shots taken with it. I've used it a lot at weddings and events. And so certainly there's been some bumps along the way. Um, you know, I don't try to go out of my way to abuse my gear. I do try to protect it. But at the same time, you know, it's, it's been used like a working professional would use it. And I believe that it's held up beautifully well. You would have a hard time distinguishing this particular copy from a brand new one, I believe. And so a kudos to them on that front. Now, when you talk about autofocus, that's an area where this lens does have some advantages against some uh, competitors. And that's, of course, certainly true when you're talking about the Milvis lens that I mentioned, for example, since you've got to do all the focus yourself. But this utilizes uh, Canon's ring type USM ultrasonic motor focus system, and it has proven to be a very effective one. It's been very good for use um, in weddings and events and giving me accurate results. Um, it autofocuses very quickly and it autofocuses precisely. However, I will note on this particular copy, I did have to do a fair bit of work of, of calibrating to get the best focus on like my Canon 5D Mark IV. And in fact, there was a there was a couple of times that I went back to the drawing board because I felt like it did was missing some in some situations at certain distances and had to kind of recalibrate. Often it was just a point or so, but um, it, it was a lens that did require, at least in my experience, some calibration on my camera bodies. Now I've now switched over to shooting uh, exclusively on mirrorless and on mirrorless bodies, you know, like the EOS R or the RP and, and hopefully the new R5 coming out. Um, you know, these kind of focus issues issues are basically eliminated. But um, while it did require some calibration, I have gotten very effective focus results and a variety of lighting conditions. At this point, I've used it in just about every kind of conceivable lighting condition. And I've managed to get the shots that I wanted in all of those situations. And so I believe that it's done a, a good job when it comes to that. Now, like all of these USM lenses, they are not designed as video centric lenses. They are designed first and foremost uh, for stills photography. And so as a result, they're not as quiet or quite as smooth when you're shooting in video settings. So we'll take a look at the video pulls here and maybe you can get a sense of what I mean. Now these were taken on the EOS R and so as you can see the focus pulls themselves are actually fairly smooth but there is that kind of light clicking type noise that is a part of focus. It's not a stepping motor. It's not designed really with that video application first and foremost in mind. So that of course is something to consider. Now when it comes to the actual manual focus of the lens it has a reasonable focus throw 
it, it does not have any kind of particularly special uh, precision here. I find that there's a little bit of looseness as you approach the hard stop areas. And so you can actually almost kind of focus past those. It's not like a particular hard stop, like a true uh, manual focus lens. As far as our, our focus distance, I think the focus row is adequate here. It's not massive. Um, it's, it's not much more than uh, about 160 degrees or so. And so you could probably use another 30 degrees maybe in there if it were a true manual focus lens. But obviously that's not the priority here. This is an autofocus lens first. And of course the advantage, as I said, these days when we're using it on mirrorless is that you can focus pretty much anywhere and get dead on accuracy. So it makes lenses like this actually even more useful in the mirrorless age when it comes to that. Now what really set this particular lens apart, and it was a first to employ it, was Canon employed a new special element as a part of the optical design called a blue spectrum refractive optics. This really helped to distinguish the Mark II lens from the Mark I. The Mark I lens had always kind of been appreciated for having nice rendering and beautiful color. However, it was fairly prone to chromatic aberrations, as were a lot of uh, Canon's wide aperture, um, you know, prime lenses of that particular generation. The blue spectrum refractive option, or optics, really eliminated those chromatic aberrations and gave this lens a this is the reason why I felt like it acted like an Otis lens because it had that amazing amount of micro contrast and just wide open pop that particularly at the time that this lens was released, I wasn't used to seeing from Canon lenses. So let's jump in and let's take a look at the image quality and see if this lens still holds up as being special. So we'll start by taking a look at distortion and vignette here. So as far as the distortion goes, you can see there is just a mild bit of distortion there. It's a tiny bit of a wave that's in there, but fortunately the profile corrects it very, very cleanly and it's a mild amount to begin with. So probably not enough that you're going to notice in too many real world circumstances as is. And after it's corrected either in camera on JPEGs or um, via the profile afterward, it cleans up more easily. Now, uh, Obviously, we've got a fairly strong amount of vignette in this corner uh, or in the corners and it extends a pretty far away. And so, you know, like most things, there's going to be situations where that vignette is useful. Um, there's going to be a lot of situations where it's not. So that is a more serious optical flaw. Unfortunately, it's a pretty common one for uh, wide aperture, wide angle lenses like this. So let's take a look at our overall contrast and resolution here. So if we look in the center of the frame, we can see that there is great pop even at f1.4. Lots of detail that's rendered there. As we move towards the uh, mid frame, we can see that there's a pretty good consistency from the left corner to the right corner of the bill. And we can see that the lines here at the edge of the uh, chart are holding up well. Um, they're cleanly rendered. And even right into the corner, we have a very nice amount of resolution. So across the frame at f1.4, we really have a lot of sharpness and contrast. Now, a big reason for that has to do with the blue spect spectrum refractive optics that are really do an amazing job of banishing any kind of longitudinal chromatic aberration. And so as you can see here on kind of the shiny objects, there just really isn't any visible chromatic aberrations here. And as you move towards like the bokeh area, there's not any there either. And so that of course is a real strength for this lens. We look at this kind of fine line here. You just don't really see a lot of chromatic aberration, which allows it to have a really high degree of contrast to begin with. This also manifests itself in real world situations. So for this shot, for example, um, you can see that if we look at our, our subject plane, we have really, really crisp lines, very, very low chromatic aberrations. And thus we have a nice three-dimensional pop, even at a wider focal length like this, and the capability of producing really stunningly good images. Now, if we move from f1.4 to f2, you can definitely see that there is an increase in uh, contrast here. The whites look wider, the darks look a little bit darker. And so that's uh, one noticeable improvement. Moving over here, we can see the same is true if you look at the, the white and the black lines. You can just see that there is a you know, bigger variance between the two also on the bill there. And moving off into the corner, while everything looked great before, you can just see how much stronger the contrast is by comparison here in the corner. It is very crisp. 
Moving on to f2.8, there really isn't a massive amount of difference here now at this point. I mean, it is already really, really crisp. There's a little bit of improvement of contrast, but we are we're reaching near optimal levels. It's probably out resolving the 30 megapixel sensor that I am testing on here. And so, I mean, it's just a massive amount of re resolution. So taking a quick look at the bokeh geometry here, as is fairly typical for a 35 millimeter lens, you've got some deformation in bokeh circles, kind of a lemon shape towards the edge. The bokeh circles themselves are fairly clean here and these brightest ones, not really too much in the terms of concentric circles. You can just see a little bit of pattern busyness in there, but overall quite smooth and a nice result when you consider how uh, strong and contrasty the lens is. The bokeh is reasonably soft. So looking at the geometry as we stop it down from f1.4 to f2, and so you can see in f2 where you know everything is a little bit more circular, just a little bit of clipping there at f2.8, um, you know, mostly all circular shape. However, if we look in here closer, you are starting to see the non-agonal shape of the aperture blades. And if we move on to f4, that's a bit more obvious. Fortunately, uh, you know that's about as bad as what it's going to get. Now, just a quick visual comparison between this, uh, the 35L, and what is the other competing fantastic lens in this space, and that is the new Tamron SP 35mm f1.4. And so both of them are super, super sharp, as you can see at f1.4. Now, here we're more looking at the quality of the bokeh, and uh, I don't see a massive difference between the two. The Tamron may have the slightest, slightest edge in terms of the softness of the bokeh, um, but there's not a whole lot to be kind of seen from either one of them. They're, they're more similar than different. Now, the actual quality of the blur, I think, is pretty great, and when you mix this beautiful sharpness with the ability to have a nice, you know, creamy bokeh region. I think the lens is capable of producing some really stunning, you know, artful type images like this by utilizing that. I've also utilized it um, in this way, like when shooting at weddings. And uh, obviously, again, you have the ability to have a really crisp detail without any marring from chromatic aberrations, but then a nice melting away to defocus. Likewise here, I've in shooting like an engagement type shot here, you can see a beautiful detail and you know a nice fall off to the subject. A little bit of jitteriness maybe here in this uh, you know kind of transition zone, but overall the effect of the image I think is really quite stunning. Beautiful color, which you know is kind of a canon thing. Here's an image that I shot uh, in promotional materials for a resort, and so you can see uh, just incredible amount of detail that's capable. You stop down a bit. I mean, and just everywhere that you look in this image, the detail is just really fantastic. And that is obviously the strength of this lens. It is a, an amazingly sharp lens. Here's another example from a music event that I shot. And so you can see, uh, once again, it's not going to obliterate the background even at f1.4, but you can see a really cool effect and a nice handling of the both the sharpness and then the softness that you know makes this lens pretty special. Here's another example from a wedding shot. And so you can see, you know, really crisp detail in the foreground and then a really nice transition to defocus. It's a special lens. Now I wanted to share another shot from another wedding to kind of just show off another strength of the lens and that is its ability to focus in more challenging situations. A couple coming outside, the only real lighting here is from the uh, sparklers that the guests are holding. They're outside kind of the range of these lights back here. And so as you can see, however, uh, Focus had no problem in locking in and uh, producing a, you know, a cool looking shot, even under challenging conditions. Now, one area where I was left wanting somewhat is, is in flare resistance. And so on the shot on the left, you can see at f1.4, uh, you can see that there is the veiling I don't mind. That's actually quite beautiful to me. What I do mind are these ghosting artifacts that very easily could run a shot. Here at f11, you can see that it becomes even worse with a more definite ghosting pattern coming down. But it's these artifacts down here that are the problem. So you're going to have to be careful in your composition uh, to make sure that you put some of this stuff at the right spot because it can either be destructive or non-destructive depending on how you compose.
So the answer to the question of whether or not this lens is still optically special, even in 2020, I think the answer is yes. Uh, as I've noted, there are some 35 millimeter lenses that I think are very, very competitive with it that have been released. And of course, not just on the Canon space. Um, you know, there are newer lenses like on Sony, like the Sigma 35 millimeter F1.2 um, art series lenses that are really, really amazing lenses. However, you know, much even physically larger and heavier than this particular lens. And so for being a moderately sized and weighted lens, I think that this lens is really special. And in fact, it's smaller and lighter still even than the Tamron 35 millimeter F1.4 that I mentioned. And so as far as the optical package, you know, in a reasonably compact form, I think that this lens still holds up as being very, very special. Above all, let me show you some photos here because this is the lens that was good enough that after I purchased it, I had always shot weddings and events basically with a combination of 24 to 70 millimeter and 70 to 200 millimeter f 2.8 zoom lenses. And what I found is that I love the images and the flexibility of that f 1.4 aperture and the ability to shoot at that uh, so much in those wedding and event type venues that I eventually uh, stopped using the 24 to 70 in place of the 35 millimeter. And after a while, I actually sold my 24 to 70 millimeter zoom because it just wasn't getting used to the same degree. That's saying a lot for a prime lens to bump such a flexible zoom like that. But the images off of this lens were just so special that um, it really kind of captured my attention. And this is the lens that I wanted to use in those applications. And so at the end of the day, I think that this continues to be one of Canon's very best. And while Canon has kind of opened up new horizons on the RF mount that has allowed them to produce some really, really amazing prime lenses, I think that this lens still stands with those newer lenses as being some of Canon's very best work when it comes to a prime lens. It is expensive, of course. It's always been expensive. Um, right now, the price has dropped down to where you can get it for $1,700 to $1,800 US, but it's still a very expensive lens. However, I can tell you now, having used it long term, it holds up well. It produces beautiful images. It's a lens that you can rely on. So maybe for you, that might make it worth the money. I'm Dustin Abbott. If you look in the description down below, there is a linkage there to an image gallery so you can look at these photos for a little bit longer than a split second or so. Um, there's also buying links there if you'd like to purchase one for yourself and also linkage to for you to support this channel, to follow me on social media, to become a patron, sign up for my newsletter. And if you haven't already, please click that subscribe button right here on YouTube. Thanks for watching. Have a great day.